to use Kubernetes volumes, you really have to understand a persistent volume and persistent volume claims and the abstractions that we mentioned in the previous video. So we're going to start with a pod. And we know from a previous example that a pod is going to have volume mounts, which will list the mounts that it wants. But it's also going to have something called a persistent volume claim or just a claim. So we'll just zoom in a little here. So you have your volume mounts and your volumes. Under volumes, you're going to have your persistent volume claim. And under volume mounts, you might have something like slash foo. This persistent volume claim is really important. And it's important because it is the link to the actual definition of the Kubernetes resource or Kubernetes object, which is in fact the persistent volume claim. In other words, the pod itself knows that it has a claim, but the full claim details are listed here. And so it just links to it. And you can see that here, a pod will access storage by using the claim as a volume. And notice that this PVC, this resource, is an abstraction. And it's something that the user can create. It does not need to be created by an administrator. This is also the location where you indicate how large you want the volume to be. It's also the place you'll see selectors, which essentially find and locate and then use the underlying persistent volume, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, here's the YAML that would accompany something like this. The persistent volume claim is listed as the kind. Here's the storage size. And then we have these selectors, which have match labels. In this case, it's looking for a stable label on the volumes, which we'll look at in a second. You also have this option of a match expression. So if you need to use keys and values to do the selecting, you have that option. Here are the various access modes. If we take an example like read write many, that means that the volume can be mounted as read write by many nodes. Now, one mysterious looking thing might be the storage class name. And that actually refers to the type of provisioning, whether it's static or dynamic. And we're going to talk about that in more detail. But here is a good place to pause the screen for more detail. Static provisioning refers to what's called a persistent volume. And dynamic refers to the storage class. OK, so what does that mean? Well, remember the flow. The volume is going to connect over to persistent volume claim. The persistent volume claim is either going to connect over to a persistent volume, which you would expect, or connect over to a storage class. And the thing that determines the routing is storage class name. If you provide one, then this will happen. If you don't provide one, then you'll get this behavior here. Now, regardless, that connection is called a bind, which means that this connection is also called a bind. Binding is described here, and you can see a control loop on the master watches for new PVCs, finds a matching PV, if possible, and binds them together. Once bound, persistent volume claim binds are exclusive, where exclusive means you cannot bind two PVCs to the same PV. And just to be very, very clear, this is a PVC and this is a PV. But notice that although you can't bind two PVCs to the same PV, you can use the same PVC in two different pods, which means you could create a brand new pod then copy this volume section into it, and then have two totally separate pods connecting to the same PVC. Now, remember earlier we talked about this selector. Now, right here, I have only drawn a single persistent volume. But if you have multiple persistent volumes, how do you know which one to select? And that's the idea behind a selector. And we're going to cover more detail about what's inside a persistent volume, but one of the things is a label. And when you provide the various labels, say A here and a B here and a C here, if you say that your persistent volume claim needs to have an A, then it'll go here. If you say it needs to have a C, then it would, of course, go here. Okay, so what is a persistent volume? And for that matter, what's a storage class? Well, ultimately, they're both attempting to do roughly the same thing. And that is to act as an abstraction, another abstraction, into the underlying physical storage that your cloud provider is offering. So that may be file storage in the case of Bluemix, or EBS or EFS, or PD in the case of Google, or NFS, 
And that is explained right in the introduction of the provisioning in the volumes section of Kubernetes website. The persistent volume subsystem provides an API, and the persistent volume is a piece of storage in the cluster that's been provisioned by an administrator, as we saw before. They are volume plugins, and they contain enough details to connect into one of these systems. So it lets your administrators, Kubernetes cluster administrators, deal with the persistent volumes and lets your users deal with the PVCs. So this is a way to sort of say, this is dev and this is ops. Here is an example YAML file of this. You can see that it is a persistent volume. You can see it has five gigabytes of storage and you can see that it's set up as NFS, and here are the various options to configure that NFS. You'll also notice that they have a persistent volume reclaim policy, which tells the cluster what to do with the volume after it has been released of its claim. So if you want to see this, you can do a kubectl get PV and take a look at some of the results. You'll see the capacity, the access modes, the reclaim policy, the status, and you can see the claim. So this is what we've been talking about. You see the default namespace listed here, and you see the storage class if one was listed along with how long it's been running. So that command of get PV was telling us persistent volume. What about storage class? How would we see that? Well, probably not too surprisingly, do a get SC, or you could type it out, storage class. And in this case, we see no resources found. So what happens if you have no storage class objects that are marked with the default annotation or otherwise? Then what happens is it, you will not trigger dynamic provisioning, and you'll see instead persistent volumes. In other words, you might have provided this and expected this behavior, but if it's not there, then as we said before, you'll see this. So if you're sort of scratching your head about what's a storage class and how does that fit in with dynamic provisioning, take a look at this page that says a storage class provides a way for administrators to describe the classes or types of storage that they offer. Here is an example of a storage class and you can see that like a persistent volume, it provides all the details necessary to connect to the backend physical storage. And you can see that storage classes are the foundation of dynamic provisioning. So if you go to a PVC and you mention the storage class, you can specify which kind of storage class you want to use. So in a more real world scenario, instead of configuring the pods, you can see we're using a solution deployment in this example. And we've got the volume mounts and you've got the mount paths, just like we saw before. Those connect over to the PVCs like we had talked about, and the PVCs connect over to the PVs, which ultimately, in this case, provide NFS. Notice how the PVC has a selector of solution and logs and the corresponding solution and logs in the PV. And in the deployment, you see the volumes listing the persistent volume claims by their name. So solution log claim, and we see that in the PVC here. So hopefully that's gone some way to explain what are PVCs, what are persistent volumes and storage classes, and how those all relate to the underlying physical storage.